What's up, guys? We are in our third week of the Acta Non Verba series. Now, each week we have talked about how we love in action and how those actions are the fruit and the evidence of our internal faith. We can talk about Jesus all the time, right? But until we live out Jesus, people are going to doubt us. So last week we talked about doing what is right, even when it's hard, right? We looked at the story of Nehemiah and how he loved in action by rolling up his sleeves and then rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah could have stayed comfy in the palace with Xerxes all along, but he didn't. He left comfort behind to do what was right, where this, his home for us is doing the right thing when the culture around us is celebrating the wrong things. It's when you stand up for someone unable to stand up for themselves. It's when you are made fun of for your beliefs. Guys, those are all examples of loving in action by doing the right thing, regardless of the situation you're facing. Now tonight, we're gonna look at another story from scripture where love was put into action. It's going to start with a story that will sound like it really has nothing to do with loving in action, but I promise you guys, just trust me, it'll make sense. I'm going to leave the backstory out for now too, so that you can get into all the emotions of this story being told in 2 Samuel 12. And here's how it starts. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, how did this story make you feel? I purposely left out the names at the beginning of the story just so that you guys could listen to the situation instead of who was speaking and who was receiving the story. Two men were introduced in the story, one rich, one poor. The rich man had lots of animals as part of his estate. The poor man, he had just one lamb. The poor man fed this lamb like his kids. It grew up in the house with the family. It even slept with the family at night. One day, the rich man had a visitor come, and as he was the custom, he needed to prepare a meal. So the rich man, having an abundance of, of sheep and this massive flock of his own, took the poor man's only lamb to prepare for the meal. Now, what a jerk move, right? David felt like most of you guys probably did, and he was furious with this rich man and his obvious selfishness. He said to this rich man, he said that he deserves to die for his horrible actions, but then relents a little and says that he needs to pay back the poor man fourfold. Anyone with a moral compass would be infuriated at the actions in the story of the rich man so far. But let's keep reading. Second, 1 Samuel 12, 7 starts with a shocking revelation. And then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Nathan was smart in how he handled the story, right? If you had just come to David and told him that he was in the wrong, it probably wouldn't have been received well. But David, like any of us, would have probably gotten defensive and not listened to Nathan. But by telling the story the way he did, Nathan was able to pull David's heart into the story and it kept his guard down as he listened. And after David got all riled up, Nathan dropped this bomb on David that he was the rich man in the story. With all of his wealth, he just took the wife of Uriah and even took that man's life, Uriah's life, to cover it up. God's word for David was that he had delivered David from Saul into the throne, that all of Israel was his. And then God even told David, if that wasn't enough, I still would have given you more. But David took matters into his own hands and he committed a horrible act in his selfishness. 
Now, if you keep reading, God pronounces his judgment over David for those actions through the prophet Nathan. He tells David that the sword will never leave David's house. Now, this doesn't mean that David's going to have like a cool display on the wall with swords. Like that's, that's not what it means. It, it means that there will be drama and strife and war inside of David's family for as long as it's around. And if you know much about the rest of David's story, you know that's exactly what happened. David's own sons tried to take over the throne and there was constant fighting within the family. This sinful choice is what led to that consequence in his life. David recognized that he messed up and all the anger that he had felt towards this rich man in the story, well, it really should have been aimed back at himself. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, we read this. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Now, this probably sounds harsh of God, right? But with all the sin, any sin, there are consequences. Sometimes those consequences can affect other people that aren't directly involved in the sin. And this was the case for David here. His sin was forgiven by God, but the consequence still was in effect. The child that was conceived out of this adulterous act would become sick and ultimately pass away. And I think it's interesting how this part of the story um, kind of stops, right? Nathan has just dropped this powerful teaching moment on David. He has communicated God's judgment on David and his family for their sin. And then he shared how that consequence will affect this child. And then scripture tells us he goes home. That's it. Like Nathan was done with the situation. No gloating over David, no consolation for him. He just goes home. This dude was to the point, if anything. So in that story, where was love put into action? Who showed love and who received love? Well, Nathan coming to David and confronting him about his sin is where love was put into action. Coming into the king's court and calling him out on a sin that very few people even knew about was an insanely bold move. It would have been easier for Nathan probably just to ignore David's sin as most people did. Turn a blind eye to the adultery and to the murder, but God had seen it all. And of course, God was gonna deal with those sins in David's life. Nathan, led by God, showed David love by caring enough about him to call out his mistake. Now, am I giving you guys freedom to go around just calling people out on their mistakes? No, absolutely not. I'm saying that a great way to show love in our actions is to hold each other accountable, right? In a loving way, of course, but we're going to look at a few pointers from Scripture tonight about how to keep that interaction loving and not becoming a judgmental interaction. Sadly, a lot of people in the church don't take the time to understand how to hold people accountable in a loving way. Instead, they're quick to point fingers, they're quick to judge, and quick to accuse, Nathan gave us a great example by coming to David with a story first, right? To help him look at the situation without the emotional connection, knowing that he was the bad guy in the story. So the very first pointer that comes to mind for us from scripture is to be sure that we're looking at our own issues and keeping those in mind when holding our friends accountable for their issues, right? We can't live like heathens and then talk to our friends about how their lives aren't honoring God. That's just hypocritical. We won't be perfect, but we also can't ignore our own struggles when talking with others. Jesus speaks to this actually in Matthew 7 uh, when he says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a lo- the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. Guys, you probably have heard part of this verse before. It could be the part about the speck and the log. Some people will use the first part of the verse to justify their sinful behavior, saying that we can't judge them, right? Maybe you've heard the phrase, only God can judge me. I know this passage uh, is not really saying that, right? It's saying we're not to judge, but we are to help our brothers and sisters get the sin out of their life as we work to rid ourselves of those same stains in our own lives. But the act of clearing out sin doesn't start with the other person. According to this passage that we just read, it starts with us. 
Another great truth about our holding each other accountable is in love comes from Galatians 6, 1 and 2, where we read this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, that's a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Guys, we are to help our friends get back to their walk with gentleness. Now, Galatians calls us to watch out for our own actions as we are helping those who have wandered off, is how they put it. We are to carry their burdens. And the flip side of that truth is that as we carry others' burdens, their other people will carry our burdens. It's a beautiful dynamic there. We aren't meant to do this life all by ourselves. We're to have friends and family help us celebrate when we have a victory. And then those friends and family are there to help us carry the burden when we mess up. David had someone to help him carry the burden of his sin, of his mistake, Nathan. And he lovingly confronted David because um, that sin was already forgiven by God, but it still had consequences that he would face. And he would for years, but his sins were not held against him. And scripture reminds us that David was a man after God's own heart, even after this horrible season of life. So another way that we can love in action is by lovingly holding each other accountable to live the life that we are called to live as Christians. Guys, don't settle for the world's example. Step up to the standard that Jesus set in front of us and lean on your friends when it gets hard to reach that level, right? That's putting love into action. Guys, hope you have some great discussions in small groups. We'll see you all real soon.